did Jesus make Peter the first pope in Matthew 16? Or is something else going on that you really need to know about? You're going to have to stick around to find out. So Matthew 16 begins essentially in the same place that Matthew chapter 12 ended and Matthew 15 began. The Pharisees, and this time the Sadducees with them, are challenging Jesus to perform miracles. But he replies to them that he's not going to do that because they should be able to discern the times. Basically, what he's telling them at the end of verse 3 is you should be able to see by what I'm doing that this is something you should have been looking for. There's going to be lots of Daniel 7 references, so you want to keep your journaling Bibles or your spiral notebooks handy. I'm going to throw a few more up in the description that are a different style. Some of you don't like the illuminated and a different version of the Bible, so be sure to check that out. Also, some spiral bound ones, but get yourself something to keep these notes in. This is so important. But look at where he goes with this. He then calls them an evil and adulterous generation. Boy, that that sounds like something that we've heard before because spiritual adultery is a huge deal all over the prophets, right? Jeremiah called, he talked about the people playing the, the harlot or adulterers, that we see that, that kind of language in Ezekiel. He's using Old Testament language here to talk about their unbelief because their unbelief had become an idol to them. They then leave, that's point number one, and they go away to the other side of the sea and Jesus begins to tell his disciples, you have to watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What he's talking about is the in, their influence spreading among the people. Why? Because we're going to learn in this chapter that Jesus knows what's coming and he knows it's drawing near. So be careful of their influence, not just maybe in their own heart, but maybe in the people around them. But the disciples don't understand this. They think Jesus is hungry, which is really weird, right? Because they've seen him feed 5,000 people and 4,000 people. And he even makes that point to them when he says that you have such little faith. Why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Basically, this is exactly what we said in chapter 12, that their lack of understanding means that they don't have faith. Why don't they have faith? If they had understood who Jesus is, they would have understood that he could have provided bread if he needed it. That He's talking about something more significant. How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware the leaven of Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood that in verse 12. Now, in verse 13, we begin to run into something interesting because this is a little like something that happens in John 6, which incidentally coincides with the feeding or shortly after the feeding of the 5,000 in that chapter where Jesus begins teaching harder and harder things, calling himself the bread of life and the bread that came down from heaven. He's asking his disciples, who are the people saying that the son of man is? Daniel 7 question. I told you, you want your notes for this. Daniel 7 question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, some say it's John the Baptist, some say it's Elijah, some say that it, that John Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, I also say to you, that you are Peter, and upon the rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, and this is the correct wording here, it's not will be, it's shall have been bound in heaven. It's not future tense, it's it, that he's talking about something that is already happening or happening at that moment. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should not tell that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. And I'm going to talk to you about why in a second, but really quickly, I want to give you, and this may cause us to run over if it does, I'm going to give you five things that you need to see that really prove that Peter cannot be the first pope. The first is actually in the Greek. And, and this to me is probably the weakest of them, but I want you to see this, that he calls him Peter, and that's Petros, that means tiny stone. And the rock that you're going to build upon is a Petra, which is a giant mountain. Now, I don't really like the Greek argument because I think it confuses things and I don't think it's as solid as most people who want to argue that. There's an English argument that I'm going to show you in a minute, but I'm going to save it for the end. But there's an English argument that you really need to pay attention to that really just blows this whole Peter is the Pope thing out of the water if you're open to really seeing what the Bible says. But number two, we know that after this, there, ha there have already been disputes among the disciples about who's the greatest in the kingdom. We know from this gospel and the other gospels that there's at least three more times recorded in scripture where the disciples are debating who's the greatest in the kingdom. 
if Peter is the vicar of Christ, meaning he's downloading from heaven exactly what is true and, and what God wants him to proclaim, that he can speak, what is it, ex cathedra or whatever? Have to ask my buddy Brian about that one. If Peter is that position, then why is anybody questioning who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Because Jesus has already answered the question. It makes no sense. Point number three is that Peter himself is going to say, if you go over to 1 Peter chapter 2 and you just start reading in verse 1 and you go down through verse 10, Peter is going to say that Jesus is the foundation of the church, not Peter. Peter himself says that. So Peter cannot be the foundation of the church. We see the keys to the kingdom being used in Acts chapter 2. This is point number four. We see the keys to the kingdom being used in Acts chapter 2 when Peter is the one who speaks on Pentecost and gives the first gospel sermon. And again, in Acts chapter 10, when he takes the gospel to the Gentiles and the conversion of Cornelius and his household. But the next time the keys to the kingdom are mentioned, the keys of the kingdom of heaven are mentioned, do you know who has them? It's not Peter. It's Jesus over in the book of Revelation. Look it up. It's there. Fifth thing. Are you ready? This is the one that will blow your mind. Can you think of a time in Matthew already where Jesus has talked about a rock? A rock, incidentally, that was going to be built upon. That's right, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who has built his house upon the rock. What is the rock? The wise man is the one who builds upon the sayings of Jesus. What is the rock? The sayings of Jesus, right? Peter is just told, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What did he just say? This is coming. You now have this understanding, not because you've, not because you've come to this conclusion, but because you were listening to my Father. What has Jesus been preaching since Matthew chapter 4? The gospel of the kingdom. Go over to the book of John. What has Jesus been teaching all throughout his ministry? That the words I speak come from my Father. So this is the will of my Father. You have, you've understood something God wants you to know. And I say to you, you are Peter, you are tiny pebble, and upon this rock I will build my church. What rock has Jesus told us to build on? What he says. What Jesus is saying to Peter is you have understood something I have taught you, and because you spoke from faith, I'm going to let you be the one who's the first to take the gospel to the Jews and ultimately to the Gentiles. There is no vicar of Christ. There is no supremacy of Peter above the other apostles. The, the Pope is not a biblical office. This is actually really easy. And to get Catholicism out of it, you've got to make it say everything that it doesn't say. There's your five points on that. Now, moving forward, so you got five within five. How's it, how cool is that? It's actually a 10 point. But why does he tell them that no one, they should tell no one that he's a Christ? Because he's about to die. And he begins to tell them about how he's going to be killed by the chief priests and the scribes and then ra be raised again in the, on the third day. How does Peter respond to that? Remember, if Peter's the vicar of Christ and he's getting information from heaven, Peter says, that's not going to happen. God is going to forbid that. Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Peter loves Jesus. We get that, but I want you to see, Peter is not getting special dispensation from heaven. He is not the vicar of Christ. There is no papal office in Matthew 16. It is completely forced into the text and ignoring how words have been used across this gospel. Then he ends on this note, if anyone wishes, and that should be a big torpedo in the side of Calvinism here, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes, this is the idea of desires. If you want to come to Jesus, it starts with your desire. This is not an irresistible call to grace, nor is it refusing all but a limited few into atonement. Desire, desire, whoever wishes. You might even use the word chooses, even though they're not, they're not exactly the same word in Greek, but desire is the same word as wish. Whoever desires or wishes to come after me, 
Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it for my sake, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For the Son of Man, that's another Daniel 7 reference, is going to come, and he's going to come with the glory of his angels. Look at what Jesus is, gonna, is saying that is going to happen the next time he comes, though. This is a quotation from Psalm 62 and 12 and Proverbs 24 and 12. He's going to repay every man according to his deeds. Why? Because the Son of Man is going to come into his kingdom. Big premillennial problem here. The Son of Man is going to come into his kingdom before they're all dead. In fact, Judas is going to be the only one that's dead before the Son of Man comes into his kingdom. What do we see here? What we see is that this is a huge problem for premillennialism, Calvinism, and Catholicism. That's actually 10 points today. Definitely more than your three to five. Please check out those links in the description. It actually helps the show if you click on those. And, and it, even if you don't buy them, it signals to Amazon that we're a good affiliate. But it helps the show. So please consider doing that. And let me know what you got out of it. I'd love to see your comments. And until I see you tomorrow to talk about Matthew 17, have a good day and God bless.